How is everyone tonight? I know. That movie is so good. How many of you had seen it for the first time tonight? Oh, that's amazing. What took you so long? <laughs> it's such a gift, and I'm so glad we're all able to enjoy it together. Uh, my name is Stacy Hunt. I'm a journalist based here in Los Angeles, and I'd love to bring to the stage two people who are responsible for making this film. The first is Thomas and McKenzie. And a man who wore many hats on this production and a mustache, Taika Watiti. Thank you. Cheers. S standing ovation, that's not a common thing. Congratulations. I'm not trying to leave. <laughs> So I wanna just embarrass these two with a couple or notes about some kudos that the movie has earned as of late. SAG nominations for Best Ensemble and Scarlett Johansson, which is wonderful. <laughs> Go Golden Globe nominations for Best Comedy and Lead Actor, Roman Griffin Davis, who's so wonderful. <laughs> Six BAFTA nominations, including Best Screenplay, which is very cool, love that. And I have to say, I was most excited yesterday about you breaking into that very exclusive Directors Club, your DJ nomination yesterday. It was very cool. Thank you. <laughs> Scorsese, Tarantino, and this guy. I mean, how cool is that? It's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and no. you had paid your dues. You said on Twitter that you had maintained your membership, which is good. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think I've been suspended four times from DJ <laughs> for not paying. So I'm really, I'm on to it and I'm really See, keep now, on top of it now. You got to keep paying. It, it pays off. So before we get into specifics about your careers in the movie, I'd love to know how does it feel to have seen the movie been received this way? Is it what you expected? Did you anticipate it to be more divisive? Or did you anticipate sort of a half and half? Oh, some people are like, ooh, I actually interviewed Patrick Stewart today. And I told him that I was coming to meet you. And he goes, oh, Jojo, I'm a little worried. I said, don't be, he, he seems scared about it. I said, don't be scared, Sir Patrick. It's a beautiful movie. <laughs> but it was yeah, Sir Patrick, he's, he's, you know, he's always been a bit of a warrior. Hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he's made a career he out of He out about a lot of stuff, that guy. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting to see, I mean, he has an incredible sense of humor. So I told, I allayed any fears. I said, watch it. But it's interesting that this far into the season, people are still saying stuff like that. How does it feel to hear something like that? Um, well, I like that. <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> yeah. Also, the, uh, I think most of the critics haven't seen it. Um, really? Yeah. I feel That's like too most bad. Most of the criticism has been from people. I'm, nope. So just like from the that. outside, you know, a non-education perspective of, of the film. I think for some people it's too close, you know, to be the family experience or just something that feels uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, and I... Or have, I've always known that the first 10 minutes would be challenging for a lot of people to, you know, because a lot of people feel like they need permission to laugh at things and especially with the subject matter. It's a matter. bold opening too, even before the credits. Like that's the first thing we're seeing, we're thrown right into it, which I think it yeah. makes it powerful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of swastikas. Um, <laughs> which is something I never thought I'd ever put in the movie of mine. I never thought I'd, I'd really do one of these kind of things. But, um, but yeah, divisive, like... I think in America, it's um, divisive is seen as a bad thing, and um, you know, uh, yeah, I think where we come from, like it's good, <laughs> it's, it's good. It's like well, I think everyone in this room agrees with makes you. It, makes people think, <laughs> and I think audiences, um, but definitely like in America, everything needs to be explained mm. all the time. You know, like you've got to have a backstory for every single thing, and like everyone has to like you've got to like ex you just got to explain everything, and um, and. I grew, like I think I watched Gallipoli when I was like eight. I was taken to the <laughs> cinema to see that, and yeah, it was harrowing. But yes. I like to think that you know that back back then, um, children were exposed to um, you know to more more challenging content. And mm. I think if if it's too safe and if it's too easy, then they're not um, they're not forced to think um, as much as I think they should. And I think children should be seeing films like this. Agreed. And, and Thomas, and I first met you last year for Leave No Trace. I don't know if you saw this beautiful movie that she made. Very different movie. <laughs> uh, but tell me, what, what's the transition been like for you, you know, promoting a movie like that versus this? Where are you, have you been expected to be able 
to talk d- deeply about the issues in this movie? Has there been an expectation, sort of like, okay, defend your movie now? Is it? Have you felt that way at all? Um, I don't think so. I think I've been really not shocked, but just happily surprised at how accepting people audiences have been to Jojo Rabbit because it is a, a sensitive topic and it we you know it's it's walking the wire a little bit it could have either gone really badly or it could have gone amazingly <laughs> and luckily Taika pulled it off I've got no idea how <laughs> um, but I think yeah no people have been really accepting and I, 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 I never have felt like the need to defend it um, but I have I feel I feel like it when you do a film and you, you do something that you're really really proud of and incredibly honored to be a part of then you want to talk about it and you want to talk about your experience and 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 I don't know yeah just your journey on, on into working on it and everything so yeah I haven't felt like I've needed to defend it but I've definitely just liked talking about it but um I wanted to say something about the, your previous question about um, do you know whether critics have been or the reviews have been divisive or whatever. And I, I wanted to say that uh, I've heard a lot of stories of people, um, specifically Jewish people, asking their fellow Jewish friends whether they're going to come see Jojo Rabbit. Um, like in particular, we did a Q and A in in New York, and a man stood up and said, "Hi, I'm a." I'm a teacher at a Jewish school and um, I asked my fellow Jewish teachers if they were going to come see Jojo Rabbit and they said no because they didn't want to see another film where their, their people were painted as being, as dying I guess and as, and as kind of, yeah, just really victims. scared and yeah, as victims and, and he really appreciated Jojo Rabbit because that is not who, what else it is. Of course she's a victim, but she also has an incredible amount of strength. And I think all of those people that went through that horrific, horrific time, they had so much strength and so much bravery because I, I can't imagine surviving that. And so, yeah, I think that's what. I love that. And maybe it'll just continue to reverberate and people will catch on. As this movie doesn't end on Oscar night, this movie continues forever, which is a wonderful thing. So before we talk further about the movie, I'd love to talk about the magical world that you're from, New Zealand, which it seems like paradise. Am I wrong? Is it wonderful? It's it all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and on that topic, I want to talk about the comedic sensibilities of New Zealand, which are very specific. And I remember I interviewed you and your friend Jermaine and the cast of What We Do in the Shadows at Sundance. I could not get through this interview. <laughs> The most uh, likable saboteurs you will ever experience in an interview situation. But what strikes me about New Zealand humor, whether it's Flight of the Concords or pretty much all your movies, there's such a welcoming for absurdity, but it's always kind. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about that point of reference of sort of the welcoming of the absurd, but also never mean-spirited, which I find really interesting. Yeah. Um yeah, there are different styles of comedy where they just like to pick on people, and I think we're too polite uh, <laughs> to do that. We don't like upsetting people, and that, you know, I think going into this, that's why I always thought that that you know I was kind of safe with making this is that you know there's no way that I think a New Zealander's going to make a film like this, and you know, especially not with the intention of of offending people, but it just you know in my mind this film is not. Offensive at all. It's it is it's kind, um, and it's looking at you know the the experience of children. You know, it doesn't matter what. So I think people. Are like, I don't want to see a story about a ten year old kid in the Hitler Youth. Um, you know, assuming that all ch- you know children in Germany were born evil. Um, so you know, it, it's the, our comedy. Recent, I like to describe it as the comedy of the mundane, where it's like you we. Growing up in New Zealand, you know, on an island, there's not really anywhere to go except for Australia. And um, <laughs> and so, you know, and we just spent all of our time just wandering the suburbs and trying to, you know, make fun of what was in front of us, which, you know, if you're a teenager, it's it could be really boring. So you kind of focus on those things, and that's if you look at a lot of, like, like Concords is, you know, a great example where they just 
observe and comment on the mundane. And that's, I think, where it all it comes from. And how did you initially discover this young woman and, and how, how did you know she was the right person to play this character? I'd seen her around Wellington as, as a little kid because uh, I'd know her parents. And, um, and her parents are acting in the acting profession, teachers. Oh, the theater royalty. Yes. And they're in the room, so mom and dad, right here in the front row. Mom? Miranda. <laughs> Um, but then, uh, yeah, and th yeah, just out of the blue, um, I suddenly just see her on this poster for Leave No Trace, and it's like, what? And then I realized, oh, she's like working all the time, and <laughs> she's busier than me, and so you know, she's just been <laughs> no, and, um, and so yeah, so you know, and and we, she was one of the first pe people to um, to audition, and right from the beginning, she was. Did you right do those the here or back home? The auditions? Yeah, uh, the first, well, you were back home, right? Yeah, the first one I did here in LA and then I went back to New Zealand and the recall was on Skype. Mm. Yeah. And how did you find the actor um, to play Adolf Hitler? Uh, well, um, <laughs> an exhaustive just scoured, search. scoured the <laughs> acting community and, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes when you're lo looking for the perfect person, you're... Um, your search leads you to the mirror. And, uh, <laughs> How very actory of you, by uh, the way. <laughs> I don't know, there's just something about him, and I've worked with him before um, <laughs> on many occasions, and he's a very generous actor. He takes actor. notes very he, well. Um, yeah. No, he, he, he doesn't necessarily come prepared, but um, <laughs> he's willing to do 20 takes to get it right. <laughs> uh, that's what I appreciate. Um, <laughs> So I'm always very generous to him, uh, <laughs> but I w there was never the intention of of playing that role. Um, it's really Searchlight's fault. They um, mm -hmm. when when they said they wanted to make the film, I said great, and they said, but we only really want to do it if you play Hitler. Um, and why you know, do you think they said that? Uh, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, so it was a real dream come true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Growing up in a small indigenous community in New Zealand, it's every young, <laughs> young brown boy's dream <laughs> to, uh, to uh, grow up and play the most popular guy of the 1930s in Germany. The, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it was, I, I think the, I think maybe why it works is, well, there's two reasons. Well, one is I wrote it in a specific way that I don't know if many people would have uh, would have really got the way that I wanted to do it and I wanted it to sound and I feel like um, this was based on a book by Christine yeah you, yeah well this, that character is not actually in the in the book but um, oh you invented that from that was not on the book oh I yeah didn't yeah that. Okay. but I think like um, actual actors would probably have put t like too much effort in um, <laughs> and they probably would have like studied him and tried to make so you know make it like a real depiction of Hitler, which is not at all what I wanted. I wanted him to be this sort of buffoon who was like a little bit of Jojo, maybe a bit of Jojo's dad, and just like mm. cobbled together out of his experience. Like his gossipy friend too. To. And his gossipy friend, yeah. Right. And um, so, yeah, so, and, and, the, and the second reason I think it works is because if you'd had like a big time actor doing this, I think it would have detracted from the, the heart of the story, which is about these kids, you know. I think, you know, it would have been you know, George Clooney as Hitler, <laughs> and you know, and I think that's all people would have cared about. Right. And I think when well, it becomes then it's like you start to veer into gimmick mode. I mean, it's already such There's a no gimmicks here. No gimmicks here at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked. Whatever you decided to pull off, it was amazing. And and it's so interesting, Taika. You've worked with so many kids in the last few years, and you're so gifted with with children. Um, Hunt for the Wilder People is one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen. And your first short, uh, Boy, for which you earned an Oscar nomination, which is very exciting. And I think you were asleep on the screen when they, when, yeah, that was you, that's right. During the Oscar broadcast, he pretended to be asleep and they called his name. So <laughs> we love this guy. Um, but Thomas and I would love to know, what is it about the way he directs on set that puts you at ease, but also makes you feel like you're being respected and not being treated like a quote unquote kid actor? I think the... <laughs> <laughs> I think so about a, a lot of that then, probably. <laughs> I think um, the 
what put me at ease, Pat, is that he's, you know, we're both from New Zealand, which is a very small place and everyone knows everyone. So Taika is someone that I've grown up knowing and have always really admired. Um, but with that admiration didn't come intimidation. It came, just was kind of a friendship um, thing, which was really cool. And there were so many Kiwis on set. There were, was Rachel House, Ra, like a Danielle who did makeup, a, a lot of my dad, like a, a lot of New Zealanders there. Were, so it kind of felt like some, a bunch of Kiwis had kind of taken over, <laughs> taken over. Yeah, we, like, we chill bit. people out. You know, like, yeah. yeah, no, it, I believe it. Just relaxes yeah. and drops the guard <laughs> and it's... Like and where no did you stress. shoot? Where did most of the photography take place? Perindos Studios. Yeah, in yeah. Prague. And actually, an interesting thing about Perindos Studios is that they f they originally the Nazis used those studios during World War Two to film Nazi propaganda. Wow! So it kind of came full circle. Yeah, and it's uh, out outside of uh, of Babelsberg in Berlin, which is like that's where the first stop to for your Holocaust film. Um, like the Prague is the next. Like big place where yeah, where they make um, World War Two films, and so uh, it was very strange. Like there'd be other productions there, and so we'd walk down the hall, and there'd be other Nazi soldiers walking down the hall <laughs> from some other movie. Like are those our Nazis or this? <laughs> Who's Nazis are those? Where are you guys going? Where, who's, who's are these guys? And so uh, it was like it's just really <laughs> weird, and to be uh, it's yeah. It, it, so this is it's a very unnerving um, thing, and especially like if I'm dressed as you know the idiot, then right. you know like uh, you know that's also weird. And they're like, hey, they've got they've got a Hitler. What are, you know, so, like, and so it's um. <laughs> It really sounds like a, like a Mel Brooks movie. Too many Nazis. Yeah, like, exactly, it feels like, exactly. <laughs> like a sequel to The Producers or something. Uh, so in terms of directing yourself, which is an, an art, and George Cooney, your, your friend you just spoke of, talked to him about that, and he's just sort of, you know, you just, you just do it. How did you know when to call cut? And how did you know when to do another take? And how did you know that what you were doing was working? Um, I don't usually watch anything back because um, I like to choose roles that are a little easier than other people's roles. Like I kind of know my limits and I know what you know what I'm there for. Um, I wouldn't say playing Hitler is easy. Though. No, no, that's hard. <laughs> but it's it was even, it's harder directing as Hitler. Um, <laughs> the uh, that's yeah you you suddenly become a lot nicer <laughs> to people. So you'd so be in your costume directing as him. Yeah. He had to like. <laughs> I mean, not only if I was in the scene. No, this certainly, wasn't my certainly. thing that right. I did. Um, you'd you'd wear your street clothes on other days. I understand. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And that was a stick-on mustache. It's like I'm not I'm not dumb. I'm not going right. to keep that thing on for months. But um, no, it does change the way you sort of do things a bit. You know, I might be like, so Thomas, and I think in this uh, in, in this take. Um, maybe you should, and th this is not an order, I'm not forcing <laughs> you to do this, this is a suggestion, you take this as you will. Uh, you do though, you've, it's, it's, as much as possible I take that off and I take the jacket and stuff off and just because it's, it's not a nice thing to look at you, to catch a reflection of yourself while you, you know, working and uh, oh my god, that's right. Um, yeah, so, but, yeah, but when I, am, yeah, if I'm in the scene, I'd, I would just call cut when I felt like people will we're bored. <laughs> that's, a, that's a mark of a great director. And I was so curious, having come off of a giant movie like Thor, what did you learn on that production that you applied to this movie, which is similarly large in scale, but in such a different way? It's an intimate story, but still grand explosions and action sequences. And what did you learn specifically that you applied to this movie? Um, well, the main thing I learned on Thor was that the follow-up should be... Um, potential career ender uh, so that was after all that hard work and all those doors opened up for me so here's a good move um, uh, but the main thing it's just different it's a different way it's just a completely different way of working it's too many people and it's too much stuff but it's uh, it, it, it it is a lot of fun as well. You know, like I really enjoyed it, and that was for me, one of the only watchable superhero movies I've seen in a decade. So, okay. well done. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and um, but yeah, the that going from Hunt for the Wilder People to Thor wasn't actually a huge. Um, it wasn't a, a, like as big a challenge as I thought it would be because I think at the end of the day, 
you just tend to block out the fact that there's 400 more people, you know, on, on the set. And it just comes down to, you know, two or three people in the rectangle hmm. trying to remember their lines <laughs> and say them convincingly. Um, so you so just ignore all the people behind. Yeah, you just, you're just you trying to do the same thing, which is, you know, try to tell a good story or get or make a scene work. And I, I, when it came down to that, then I felt I was more in my comfort zone. Hmm. And Thomas, I went, uh, you had a lot of cute scenes and some really hard scenes and some very emotional scenes. What day for you was the hardest in terms of getting through a sequence or a specific scene? You had so many great moments with, with Roman's character. I think um, probably the harder scenes were the, the more emotional ones with Roman because it was so heartbreaking watching him do his amazing and really convincing acting and sometimes just watching him, it would just make me cry because it was so devastating. But I think the hardest thing of the entire um, project was kind of the research side and, and, and learning more because I already had, I already knew about, I'd studied World War II at school, I knew about the Holocaust, but I, you learn the facts, you know, teachers don't really want to be telling you about the, the really hard stuff that, and just disgusting stuff that happened back then. So I think learning about that was the hardest part and kind of going, okay, this is a really, you know, very big job mentally, but it's a, there's pressure to, to tell the, give the story justice, I guess. So um, I think that was the hardest part of the job. And how hard was it at the end of the day to try to leave it behind and try to be a normal young person and live I your life? I think just the, the people that were was on set all the time, like like I said before, it was such a fun Kiwi set that you can, you can, you know, when you go home at the end of the day and have dinner with Roman and Hardy and Gilby, Roman's twin brothers and his family, you can't be, you have to be, you know, awake and onto it because <laughs> there's a lot of right. stuff going on. So I think you, I couldn't, it was, I couldn't really dwell on, you know, the stuff we'd done that day because I had a lot of distractions. I think it's also important with, you know, when you, you're doing things like this to, to just try and like shake it off at the end and, and, and leave it behind. And, you know, if you do take all the stuff home, um, then it becomes a very depressing way of working. And I think, you know, you, you can let it affect you too much. And I know that um, people on 12 Years a Slave talked about the same thing, that they would have like make a real effort at the end of the day to like enjoy life after mm. work and, you know, and remind themselves that they're, they're still good in the world. Mm. And something I've come to realise like, over the past couple of years is that it's so hard to do a good job when you're in your own life, when you're not very happy, when you're you know, maybe taking on too much of the character and, and not leaving it behind at the end of the day. It's a lot harder to do your job. And if you're in a, a good mood and, a, and um, it just, it's easier, even if the, the, the material is tough or the scenes is, even if you're doing a crying scene, if you show up to work, engaged and happy and not too in inside yourself um it's just it's easier and what are the staples of a kiwi craft service table marmite marmite yeah <laughs> well it depends uh, it's, you know there are different scales so how about snack wise and then a, a lunch what well i worked on staples? a thing with kathy the producer who's here somewhere and um uh we did a tv show it was very like, it was almost no money um involved and i think like there was most of the food was like a tray of chopped up carrots <laughs> and like one of those things you get from a supermarket which is like a dip that you can sort of stick them in <laughs> and the carrot wouldn't even have any knives it was like a plastic knife to chop the carrots up <laughs> which basically looked like they'd been chewed into sticks <laughs> and um so that's sort of like that's like the you know the mid-level and um <laughs> it just goes up from there uh but yeah the yeah the food is very good on new zealand so it's <laughs> For example, we need, I need a, I need an example for lunch. Like, what would you have for lunch? Well, I mean, you name an animal, it'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I Prague is a very meaty country, so at, at we love at, our like, meat for, <laughs> for craft services. It was you know like salami and cheese and very heavy food, and I'm vegan, so that wasn't always okay. Convenient. See, now we're getting somewhere. I knew there'd be you know some backstory what? here. <laughs> Did you have to bring your own food? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. No, there would always be something, but yeah. I probably had about 65 schnitzels when I, <laughs> over the course of, of that shoot. Well, you were in character after all. 
So I would love to talk yeah. about the final scene and the use of David Bowie's heroes. It's his birthday today, by the way, so happy birthday, David Bowie. We miss you very much. Why that song? I mean, I know literally why this, it's called Heroes, but how many other songs did you consider before choosing that one? Because it's just uh, that so That was the perfect. only one that was in from the very first draft that was always there. Um, and uh, what else was always there? Everybody's Gotta Live by Arthur Lee and Love and Tom Waits that was always in there. Um, so you always knew you wanted contemporary music. Woven. Yeah, yeah. And even the dialogue is very contemporary and it was important that... Um, you know, the, 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 this didn't feel like a lot of the other films that have you know, dealt with this. And, uh, and I wanted young people to see it and feel like they could actually understand what people were talking about. And so it, to contemporize the dialogue and especially, um, I felt like young people could, could somehow see that this can totally be happening right now. Mm. Um, you know, except these kids right. don't have cell phones and they just dress a little different. But Right. It's, it well, the sort should of feel like a very like, um, contemporary uh, story. And also what I love about what the story tells us is how kids are innocent until they're ingratiated into some terrible stuff. And I think that's what, I think it's happening all over the world in so many different ways. And I think that's what's so relevant and unfortunately still contemporary. So hopefully people take away that piece of it. In terms of music, one of my favorite parts of the film or like one, I think one of the smartest was the opening scene where Taika compared um, the you know pe to the Germans' love of Hitler to Beatlemania, and that's why he <laughs> used that Beatles song. I thought that was just really smart and kind of opened your eyes to well, they, he ma brainwashed people like there was so, so much just manipulation. Like the yeah, <laughs> those Beatles—they've been plotting that for a long time. No, not to be trusted. <laughs> they are not. So before we go to audience questions, I wanted to ask, uh, award season is its own crazy, bizarre universe. And I'm wondering, have there been moments where you have felt you're in a room with someone, someone's giving you feedback on the movie and you can't believe you're having a conversation with that person? Maybe it's someone whose work you admire. I know Mel Brooks has been very open in his love of your film, which makes sense. Uh, has there been another interaction like that for you where people have glowingly t told you how much they loved it? If any, whenever someone like really famous comes up to me and if they say something about Jojo Rabbit, I'm just so starstruck that everything like kind of falls away and I completely blank on what they actually said. <laughs> and I'm just kind of standing there like, <laughs> like, like for example, ah, what do I do? Well, like for example, oh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Literally your brain was erased in that moment. <laughs> yeah, my one was definitely Mel Brooks when... Um, you know, he's he's been very um, very positive uh, about the film, and and that's it means a lot to me. Like we were at this AFI lunch the other day, and you know he called out the film and you know and and praised it in front of you know all of these other people who were do, you know taking part in this award season thing, and um, and that was great. And I leaned over to Carthy and I said, oh, you know, what? this whole weekend could turn to shit. This is great. This is all we need. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> You know, and that is that kind of that validation from someone you know who's a hero and also who's who who went before you and you know really opened those doors and, and trod that path and you know I feel like I just sort of slipped in behind all those guys and you know sort of yeah and me too I'm doing it uh, <laughs> uh, but you know like for just yeah to hear that and also especially with with um, you know with one of the comedy greats because. Yeah, I think another thing that that can put people off is this idea of mixing humor with World War Two, or you know, or, or with something that's you know a little touchy. And you know, some people say, "Well, we're not ready for that," which is you, you know really surprising, considering you know we've been doing it since 1939. And um, and for me, comedy is is you know one of the most important tools in in combating bullies and dictators and and um, and intolerance, and it's you know just to, to to sort of say that comedy is not really an important um, art form. I think is is a little ignorant. I agree. Yeah. Okay, so we have some wonderful audience questions. The first is from Ben. Where is Ben? Ben is somewhere in this room. Hi, Ben. I think in the back. Okay. Oh, hey, Ben. How are you doing, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, Ben? <laughs> Ben's question is, for the heartbreaking reveal, you chose to focus on Rosie's shoes to great effect. Can you tell us about the process that led to that decision? 
Um, I never wanted to show uh, Rosie and the gallows. I didn't feel like it was sort of. Uh, I didn't think that we had the right, I guess, as an audience to see, you know, his mother like that. And um, I felt like it was his moment. And also I just, there's some things I feel like will really pull audiences out. And especially if you're seeing some, like, you know, Scarlett, I think some audiences would go, oh, is that, oh how did they do that? Oh, is that, oh, well, I know she's not dead. She's in Marriage Story. And uh, that, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, so I, I think it can, I think if you sort of just like keep it with you know in his point of view and within his his sphere of, of experience, um, you know you can you can sort of hold on to that moment and make it more impactful. And with the shoes, obviously, there's you know that tie into like you know just the I think the connotations of shoes with you know around that period and what that means to a lot of people. And um, you know because she's you know. It, with all of her dancing and, and, and just that whole thing with the laces and everything, I just felt like it was a little more um, classy. And also it feels like a, like a real gut punch because you're also trusting us that we understand what you're telling us. It, it feels a little... Not, Again, not, it's not over-explaining it. Right, and I think it makes us feel better as an audience, like, oh, he knows, he knows that we know, which I thought was really beautiful. Uh, next question is from Sebastian. Where's Sebastian? Somewhere. Oh, hello, oh, hi, Seb. Um, he would like to thank you for your inspiring film and also ask you, Tyga, what were some uh, obstacles and fears that you had in getting the film made, which you sort of hinted at a little bit, but maybe take us back a little bit further pre-Searchlight. Was this very difficult to <laughs> get people on board with? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an almost impossible film to pitch, obviously, because, you know, you, you lose it interest they lose interest, you know, quite soon after you say, picture this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a little boy who's, uh, wants to be the best Nazi he can. Like, that's not something that I would even have, like, automatically said, yeah, definitely, we've got to make And did that. you have the novelist's blessing to, to adapt her book, essentially? Did you work yes. with her at all? Yes, you yes, did. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. I got in touch with her before, okay. you know, early on, and we talked a lot about it. Um, and, but, yeah, the... So that was a challenge, and I decided just to write the best script I could and let that be the pitch, I guess. And that was, you know, the, the whole intention was just, you know, let people read it. And much like the film, it's like, don't judge the script yet until you read it, and then you'll get it. Because tonally, you know, it does have, you know, it's, it's very similar to this, and, uh, you know, it kind of goes in and out of, um, you know, and it turns very fast um, between comedy and, and drama. And... Uh, and it's always been my, that's my sensibility is to always mix those two. I love that. And our final question is from Jeff. Where's Jeff? Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> you get your own greeting as well from him. Uh, Jeff would like to know, what do you like best and why? Acting, directing, and writing. And congrats on your DJ nomination, he says. Thank you. If you uh, had to choose, which, which do you enjoy, if you can possibly choose? Uh... I think directing because you know I can achieve more of a um, a god status, um, <laughs> and you know really creating those worlds and um, commanding everyone and I'm um, control. Um, the writing part is very lonely, um, and the writing part of me is just so finicky and just like oh you've got to get that line right, and the actor part of me is like. Fuck you, I'm gonna do, I'll do what I want. I'm interpreting your words, how I, you know, this is my character now, and the director part of me, the direct, director part of me is like, you two quit it. Uh, I'm running out of time and I need to get this shot. So, you know, they all kind of work with each other. Um, but the directing part uh, for me is, I love being on set and shooting because it's such a communal feeling and it's, you know, it's, it, you know, it's like having a family and, you know, and the stuff that you're making, it's, um, you know, it, you know, alchemy, <laughs> alchemy, man. But, but it does feel like that when you, you find something and then you go back to being lonely again in the edit. And, um, uh, but yeah, the, I think the directing part. I mean, I've, I've come to enjoy acting more. I used to act before I was a director and then I, I started hating it. And then I just started working with this one director and it just something happened. I've really <laughs> fallen back in love with it because also he just keeps writing these parts for me. <laughs> 
I feel like I want to see, remember the movie Multiplicity with Michael Keaton? A Multiplicity adaptation mashup where you're arguing with all of yourselves while you make a movie. So just put that pitch you know, in your folder. We have to wrap, but thank you so much for being here. Congratulations. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Cheers. Have a great night. <laughs>